Philip Allen was a significant figure in the development and expansion of 18th century Bath. A self-made entrepreneur, he owned the stone mines at Coombe Down on the southern hills above Bath, which provided most of the stone for the building of the 18th century city. You bump into his name all over Bath. Ralph Allen Drive, Ralph Allen School, the Ralph Allen Press. His portrait hangs in the pump room and in the banqueting room of the Guildhall. And yet, on my standard tour of Bath, he barely gets a mention. Once standing on Grand Parade overlooking Pulteney Weir, I look up to his magnificent Palladian mansion at Prior Park on the skyline and then pan round the southern ridge to that rather comic folly known as Sham Castle. A few sentences about Ralph Allen and that's it. On to more exciting stuff like Russell Crowe or rather his stunt double jumping into the River Raven at exactly that spot in Les Mis. So, why so little coverage about Mr. Allen? Well, I have to confess, I found him a very worthy fellow, but just a little bit dull. Contemporaries spoke so highly of him. Nobody had a bad word to say about him. He was almost too good to be true. But now that ASC has acquired number two, North Parade Passage, one of the houses in which Allen lived before he built Prior Park, I thought it was time to find out more about this goody two-shoes. Acting rather like a tabloid journalist, where heaven forbid, could I find any of those colourful anecdotes and human foibles uh, that had so far eluded me? Uh, could I make Ralph Allen interesting? We don't know a great deal about Allen's early life. He was born in Cornwall. His father was probably an innkeeper. As a youth, he was working at the post office at St. Colin Major, run by his uncle and his grandmother. He was obviously bright and competent, so by the age of 15 he was working at the post office in Exeter and two years later he was transferred to Bath, arriving in the city in 1710. Two years after that, at the age of 19, he was put in charge of the both Bath uh, post office and it was at that point that he transferred the premises to numbers 1 and 2 North Parade Passage. Now, in 1715, Allen had a, a stroke of luck with regard to his involvement in the Jacobite uprising of that date. A year earlier, poor Queen Anne had died, having had 17 pregnancies but no surviving children. George, Elector of Hanover, had been selected as the next best Protestant in line, even though there were at least 50 other people with better claims to the throne, but they were all Catholic. So supporters of James Stuart, the old pretender, saw this as a great opportunity to put the Stuarts back on the throne. Uprisings were planned for London, for Scotland, for Cornwall and for the West Country. Bath was a hotbed of Jacobite activity. Major General George Wade was sent to Bath to quash the rebels. An arsenal of arms, 200 horses uh, were discovered and the Jacobite leaders were captured. Wade's success was assisted by Bath, Bath's young postmaster, uh, who passed on valuable information uh, to Wade. Uh, we don't know if he opened suspicious mail or whether he had a tip-off from his Cornish contacts. But Wade was grateful to and impressed by Bath's uh, young postmaster, uh, and uh, Wade became a very uh, valuable ally and supporter of Allen in the future. Uh, later, Wade becomes Member of Parliament for Bath for 25 years and incidentally he's the subject of the sixth and last verse of the English National Anthem. I won't, I won't sing it to you but have a little Google, have a look. Um, it's a bit rude to the Scots or at least to, to Jacobite rebellious Scots. Anyway back to Allen in his post office. In the 18th century the postal service was overseen by the postmaster general who passed out parts of the service to individuals for a fee. Now, these people took a risk but hoped to make a profit. Um, given the lack of scrutiny, it was a system which just invited corruption. Uh, now, originally there were just six main postal routes in the whole of the country, all originating in London. So all of the posts went in and out of London, which was incredibly inefficient. Now, by the time of Ralph Allen, cross posts were just beginning to be introduced. 
and Allen saw the opportunity of expanding these. So in 1719, he applied for the contract to run the crossposts in a large part of the West Country. Now, this was a considerable risk. He was having to pay £6,000 for this. Some of the money was lent to him by Major General Wade. And through uh, efficiency and attention to detail and the elimination of fraud, Allen was eventually making £12,000 a year profit on his cross posts. That's approaching uh, a million pounds in today's money. So with this accumulating capital, he looked to invest in his next business enterprise, which was stone. So back to North Parade Passage. Uh, in 1727, Allen had secured the lease on the property, which enabled him to improve it. Uh, the terrace had actually been built in the 1620s and not, as it says on the plaque, Sally Lund's 1482. Um, so Allen engaged the architect John Wood the Elder to put a Georgian facade on the front and the back of the property and to an, uh, add an extra story on the top. And the extension, uh, what is now the back of the property, um, is now known by everybody as Ralph Allen's townhouse. But it was almost certainly built as his office. And it is magnificent, uh, like a, a miniature Roman temple, um, richly decorated, which is very unusual for Bath. It's usually attributed uh, to John Wood, but recently people have, have cast doubts on that. Now, at about the same time, Allen was buying up the uh, stone quarries and mines at Coombe Down. Um, giving him a near monopoly on the supply of stone for the uh, expansion of Bath. He brought the same qualities to the stone industry that he had applied to the cross posts. So economy, um, uh, scrutiny, uh, attention to detail uh, and so on. In 1731, he built a tramway down what is now Ralph Allen Drive uh, to the river at Whitcomb. Um, and so from there, the stone could be uh, taken by barge to Bristol and beyond, thanks to the fact that now the river had been made navigable, an enterprise in which Allen had shrewdly invested. Um, so as a result of all these improvements, the price of Ralph Allen's stone came down by 25%. And the contracts that he was winning at, the, uh, at that particular time, to give a couple of examples, at the, the Corn Exchange in Bristol, which was designed by John Wood the Elder, and St Bartholomew's Hospital in London. Now, another tick of approval for Ralph Allen. He was considered to be an enlightened employer, concerned for the welfare of his, of his workers. Um, he guaranteed them employment, gave them a regular weekly wage, and provided good quality housing. Um, which was designed by, by John Wood. Those alums who lived in Pride Park Road will remember a row of workmen's uh, houses at the bottom of the road, uh, built for the masons on the wharf. Uh, there was a similar terrace at the top of the hill for the quarrymen. These are probably the oldest examples, oldest surviving examples of industrial housing in the country. Now, this wasn't just a philanthropic gesture on Ralph Allen's part. Um, he reckoned on better pro productivity from a, a, a satisfied workforce as well as being able to attract the most skilled workers. Not everybody was convinced of the suitability of Bath Stone as a building material. Uh, some detractors compared it to Cheshire cheese, soft and crumbly. Uh, when Allen and Wood uh, put in a bid for the contract to supply Bath Stone for the new hospital at Greenwich in London, um, Portland Stone was preferred. So they began to think of an idea of designing a mansion that would show off a Bath Stone in spectacular fashion. Uh, the result was the magnificent Prior Park, which was like a stunning advertisement for Bath Stone demonstrating its beauty, its versatility, and its value. 
uh, Wood's design for the site was, was brilliant, using the, the natural amphitheatre at the head of a steep valley with breathtaking views of the city of Bath. Uh, the mansion itself uh, has been described as the most ambitious and the most complete recreation of a Palladian villa on English soil. Well, Alan became a hospitable and generous host at Prior Park. He liked to surround himself with cultural arty types, particularly writers. He wasn't interested in hobnobbing with the aristocracy at the upper reaches of society who frequented Bath. Um, two of his most regular guests were the Fieldings, a brother and sister, Henry and Sarah. Sarah was given Whitcomb Lodge rent-free and an annuity of £100. Uh, Henry was living in Twerton, writing Tom Jones and popping over to Prior Park for dinner on a regular basis. It's generally accepted that the character of Squire Allworthy in Tom Jones is based very largely on Ralph Allen and a description of Squire All Allworthy could equally apply uh, to, to Alan. Um, and here it is. A man whose penetrating genius had enabled him to raise a large fortune in a way no, where no beginning was chalked out to him. That he had done this with the most perfect preservation of his integrity and not only without the least injustice or injury to any one individual person but with the highest advantage to trade and a vast increase of the public revenue. That he was most industrious in searching after merit in distress, most eager to relieve it, and then as careful, perhaps too careful, to conceal what he had done. Well, Alan was certainly extremely generous to, to Fielding, and when Fielding died, took on the responsibility of paying for the education of Fielding's uh, children. Um, incidentally, um, Alan and his first wife had one child, George, who died at the age of three months and no further children arrived. But he was very intent and determined uh, to look after uh, the children of both his friends and his family. The writer whose name appears most regularly in the Prior Park guest book was the poet Alexander Pope. He once came for Christmas and stayed for three months. A Pope was quite diminutive, so Alan designed this special little green chair to fit Pope's tiny frame. Um, Alan involved Pope more and more in the design for the Prior Park grounds, um, and these designs reflected the, the changing nature of, of landscape design at this time. No more straight lines. Um, in the words of Pope, um, all art consists in the imitation and study of nature. A couplet by Pope about Alan reflects the, um, uh, the ideas of Fielding that we heard earlier. Let humble Alan with an awkward shame do good by stealth and blush to find it fame. Um, interestingly, the first draft of that read, let, let low-born Alan, and that was changed to, to humble. Now, Alan's generosity wasn't just confined to family and friends. He was one of the prime movers in the building of the General Hospital in Bath in Upper Borough Walls, uh, now known as the Min, and about to become another luxury hotel, or possibly. Um, Alan supplied the stone free of charge and also a considerable uh, donation. During the icy winter of 1739-40, Alan went quietly about helping people as best he could. Pope says of him at this time, he suffers no misery near him. Whoever is lame or in any way disabled, he gives weekly allowances to the wife and children, besides large supplies of other kinds to the poor. Well, I neglected to say very much about Alan's political activities. He was a friend and a supporter of William Pitt the Elder and persuaded Pitt to stand as Member of Parliament for Bath in 1757, just after Pitt had bought, uh, bought uh, Number 7 the Circus, a house incidentally later owned by Nicholas Cage. In recognition of Alan's support and friendship, uh, Pitt commissioned a considerable Gothic object 
which is to stand in a very fine situation on the hills near Bath. It is for Mr. Allen, and that, of course, uh, was Sham Castle. Now, Allen died in 1764, and his final resting place is, is typical of him. A few years earlier, he had bought Claverton Manor on the other side of the hill uh, from Bath, and he chose to be buried in Claverton Churchyard, a quiet, relatively secluded place away from the public gaze of Bath. Um, his mausoleum, though, is rather splendid, not at all humble. Well, I don't know uh, if you still feel uh, Alan is too good to be true, um, and whether you feel I have uh, made him mildly interesting. Uh, well, I'll leave that for you to judge. <laughs> this has been the eighth and the final episode of Butterworth's Bath. Uh, during the lockdown, uh, it's been, oh, you know, an engaging commitment uh, to replace uh, guiding on the streets of Bath, where I hope I'll be back again um, uh, in the near future, after a haircut, hopefully.